my extraordinary pleasure to introduce one of my heroes. Mark's robots inspired me to work on robots in graduate school. Um, so Mark, thank you for that. It's oh. been such a great journey for me. And it started with some of the extraordinary feats you did at the Leg Lab <laughs> at CMU and at MIT. And uh, in addition to Mark, uh, who is the CEO of Boston Dynamics, MIT PhD graduate, and my hero, I would also <laughs> like to introduce um, Spot, one of our uh, most beloved uh, robots. We've all seen Spot dance uh, with the stars and um, frankly fell in, in, in love with, uh, with Spot. So Mark, please have a seat and uh, let's talk robots. Thank you, Do you so much, Do you want to introduce uh, Spot uh, better than uh, I did? I, this is Hannah Rosa, and uh, uh, Rosa Kurtz is also here helping uh, with the Spots. There she is. And this is Spot. It's funny, John Werner sent me a picture of a, an actual TED Talk I gave from a few years ago, and I was surprised that the robot we had wasn't this actual productized version. It was an early prototype, so it's fun to be back and to show off the the more uh, accomplished spot. So why don't you go ahead and just drive it around while we talk, okay? So we're just showing off a little bit. I don't know how many people have seen Spot in person. Um, one of the real calling cards for a robot like this with legs is that it can go on stairs, which means it's not confined to any one floor of a house or a, facu or a facility. And I think uh, we're gonna run it up these stairs uh, did we, we moved the microphone out of the way there. Please keep your hands out of the aisle and your feet. Uh, one of the interesting things about the robot is there's a lot going on in the robot's brain that makes it, e even though Hannah is very smart and very capable, she doesn't have to do too much to drive it. She put it in a stair mode where it tries to stay in the center. It has cameras and it's looking out in front of it finding the steps and placing its feet accordingly. It's also got a camera in the back. When we come back down the stairs, uh, it'll back down, I think, at least in this tight space. Uh, maybe the cameraman could back up uh, quicker than the robot. <laughs> and mostly today I'm gonna talk about Spot. I think, depending upon what Daniela asks me. <laughs> well, um, let's see. I don't think we have the the, um, the audience's attention oh, as, okay. long as, <laughs> as long as Spot, uh, as Spot is going down the stairs. Um. Okay, then we'll do one more thing. Let's do an arm demo. Obviously, uh, so th this robot was designed as a platform, which means it's got a flat de deck in the back, and it's sort of got a roof rack there, and you can attach all kinds of stuff to it. And so one of the things you can do is attach an arm. And in the back there, there's um, a special radio attached. Normally, it can work on Wi-Fi, but in a place like this where all of you have your phones, uh, it's really a nightmare to use uh, Wi-Fi if you want any reliability. So we're using a different kind of radio. Uh, but you can put computers on there, special visual sensors like uh, pan, zoom, tilt, and 360 cameras, LIDARs. In fact, I'm going to show a clip in a couple of minutes, and you can see some of the uh, other uh, items on there. And we've done a lot of work to coordinate the motions of the body and the motions of the arm so that you can do mobile manipulation. You know, most robot arms are bolted down. They have very limited workspace because they're in their own ways. And when you put them on a mobile base, it means that the base can position the arm optimally, get out of the arm's way if necessary, and you really have an infinite workspace. And now the robot's kind of mugging at you. It, it doesn't know that you're people out there. It doesn't really know anything in this circumstance. It's really uh, uh, Hannah that's uh, doing the, the emoting. But uh, OK, that's an intro. Well, Mark, um, this is amazing. Uh, let's uh, give it for Scott and for Mark. So, Mark, you said in the past that your dream is to advance bipedal and quadruple lo uh, robot locomotion to supernatural states. <laughs> How did this come to be? 
Um, mostly by sticking at it. You know, I've been doing this, let's see, I used to be a graduate student in this building. Uh, well, not in this building, in this department, but it was across the street. Uh, that was a long time ago. Uh, and that's sort of when the interest got started. And, uh, you know, just bit by bit, we thought hard about the problem, introduced dynamics. At the time when I started, the legged robots were like tables and chairs, lots of legs that stuck to the ground, moved very slowly so that you didn't have to worry about kinetic energy or bouncing or impacts or anything like that. And it seemed to me that that was the antithesis of how people and animals work. We fly, we bounce, we you know, move quickly sometimes. And so all the effort went into trying to harness uh, that kind of behavior and put it in the machine. Now this is a medium dynamic machine. If you've seen our humanoid robots, you know, just go look on YouTube, I'm not gonna show anything today. You can see that they are more, even more energetic, uh, more compliant, uh, more ambitious about the physical activity that they're gonna do. And uh, that's been pretty exciting to see. For sure, and it's been so exciting to watch your robots get better over the past three decades you've been working uh, on, on this technology. How did you decide that you're ready to have products and to put products out in the world? That's a good question. Um, I want to add one other thing to the previous question, which is the other thing we did is concentrate equally on the mechanical, physical design of the robot, mechanical, electrical, and that, sensors, and the computational side. You know, in modern times, there's a lot of people think that the computation will do everything. I don't believe in that. Uh, in the olden days, they thought that the machine could do everything. I don't believe in that. But having them both as sophisticated, as capable, as thought through as you can possibly make them, and then have the two working harmoniously together, the computing and the, and the physicality of the robot, that's where I believe the action is. Well, we brought the level of computing and physicality up to a level, and we had this platform, and we started to say to ourselves, well, could actually people, this is the answer to your question, how could people actually use this? And although we had ideas, we thought a better way to do it would be to get it out there and to see what people did. So there's almost a thousand spots out in the world, all the way around the world, uh, in different people's hands. Uh, there's about a hundred of them in universities. No, there's a hundred universities that have slightly more than a hundred of them doing R&D with them. But there's also uh, close to a thousand industrial uh, users who are trying to figure out if you could use a robot like this for their kind of problem. So I have a little clip that would show some of the use cases. There's, now there's many more than we could show uh, in a talk like this. So if you could run this. This is a spot at Chernobyl. Uh, now this was before the, the invasion. Uh, so uh, we were, there was a group from the UK doing testing to see whether you could free some of the humans from being exposed uh, to the radiation. And since they're remediating the place, they never know where the radiation is gonna be, and having a robot that can do a survey is really valuable. This is on an oil rig. You know, it's very expensive to have people and somewhat dangerous to have people on an oil rig, and because Spot can get around in these constrained, confined, and stairwayed spaces, you could have it there. And this one has two different kind of sensor modules on it, so it's being used to examine equipment like pumps and uh, heaters and other kinds of stuff on the oil rig in order to determine how things are working, you know, do routine inspections. This is at a refinery, uh, a, a British petroleum refinery, where the robot's used to measure gas leakage, uh, like methane gas, and also to read gauges. And again, you could never get around uh, a place like this if you were doing it on wheels, so we get to take advantage of our, our special, it's sort of the robot superpower, not super compared to humans, but compared to other robots. This is a, a high power electric facility where there are regions where you can't go uh, as a human because it's too dangerous, and so they can do inspections with the robot, and if they fry a robot, who cares? And one of the important use cases lately has been to scan environments, to build digital models of them, so that you can do things like the metaverse. Now this is in spot, but I thought I'd show you our other product that we're working on, uh, which is Stretch. This is the opposite. 
rather than a platform, this robot does exactly one thing, which is looks, determines that something's a box, picks it up, and then repositions it either on a conveyor belt or on a stack of boxes. And there's about a half a trillion boxes handled every year around the world. So there's tons of this kind of work to be done. It's very unpleasant work for humans, even though humans do all of it now. And we expect uh, robots like this one to be used in environments like that. I'm still waiting for my furniture to arrive. I hope that there is a, a stretch out there who's making sure that my box uh, gets delivered. So with all this, um, this effort on one side on products, on the other side on, on new um, ideas, what kind of R&D uh, is going on at Boston Dynamics? How do you balance between improving the products and figuring out how to do new things? Well, you know, Boston Dynamics has its roots in being an R&D organization. Uh, you know, the, the uh, headline to a TechCrunch story when we announced Spot was, finally, after 30 years, a product. But I looked at that and thought, well, we weren't trying to make a product for 30 years. We were trying to move the, you know, uh, move the ball down the court or, uh, you know, raise the bar on what could be done. And that's really in our heart, in our roots. And we're continuing to do that. You know, all the work on Atlas is futuristic. We have a, I'm going to tease you, we have a new activity uh, that you'll probably hear about in a month or two that's really going to push the boundaries on, on R&D and robotics. And so that's, that's really alive and well while we uh, productize both Spot and Stretch. And, you know, there'll be other things in the works there. Can you give us a hint? Or do we have to wait for a month? Uh, you know, the hint is make robots smarter which I think we all want to do. Well, absolutely. The machine is really body plus brain, so we really need right. uh, the intelligence in order to get the robots to do what they're meant to do. Now, I'm told that we have a couple of dance moves uh, queued up in spot. We don't have the music playing. In fact, we don't have the capability to do a live sync with music uh, yet. Um, but um, we do have some tools that help us, a choreography tool that helps us develop the motions uh, that the robot uses when they're dancing, and we have a whole library of moves, and in some cases we create new moves as we need them. So, taking a bow. And then this is a different motion, which is kind of, I think, much cooler, you know? <laughs> Thanks, guys. So... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Spot. <laughs> Thanks, Hannah. Thanks, Rosa. Thank you. Mark, so I see this robot. I, just, I, I can barely contain myself uh, to sit. I want to get up and dance with the robot. But some people see your robots and, um, and get scared by them. Um, what do you tell them? What do you say about that? Let me try and address that on the small scale and on the big scale. If you watch any of our YouTube videos, which um, you, there's lots of comments, and lots of the comments are, um, you know, express some concern or, or fear. Um, but if you look at the likes versus dislikes, we have an extremely high ratio of likes, uh, usually above 95%, always above 90%. And you can look at almost anything else on YouTube and you won't get that kind of a, a positive response. So I'm inclined to believe that the comments are sort of taken partly in fun, the way you express your horror when you go to a horror movie, it's not all about really being afraid of, of what's going on. You know, maybe that's self-serving, I don't know, but uh, at least some of the, uh, the level of uh, commentary on YouTube, I think, should be taken with a grain of salt. Now, at a bigger level, I think all technology, whether it's robots, cars, airplanes, lasers, computers, have uh, opportunity that they offer humankind and risk. And you should try and balance those out. Uh, I think we want to take advantage of the opportunities uh, while we mitigate the risks. Uh, I'm not saying that there aren't risks. Uh, you know, here we are at MIT where I think we're believers in, the, in what technology offers. Again, I don't think robots are any different uh, than any of the others. Uh, 
I don't believe in a dystopian future. I think, I think if you look at people closely, they don't want to live in stainless steel wor worlds where uh, machines are taking care of everything for them. They like, um, I don't know, my house is full of wood, uh, you know, wooden furniture and soft carpets. And uh, what do I care about? I care about my kids and my family and uh, uh, that I get to do interesting work. And uh, uh, there's some people who I'm angry at and, uh, you know, maybe I care about that. But I don't think we're dominated by the kinds of themes that, the, uh, that people have portrayed for dystopian future. I, I guess I just don't think that's where human, humans are going. Well, uh, you and me are in the same camp here. In fact, I love to think about a better life uh, with robots. And I'd like to end our conversation on a positive note. Um, and I wonder if you might have, if you might be able to help our audience dream about a better life should they have a spot in their home. <laughs> you know, spot isn't the right one for your home, but there will be robots for your home uh, when we figure out how to make them cheap enough how to make them useful enough, that's probably the biggie, um, uh, how to make them safe enough. And I think we're working on all those things. Um, you know, there's, there's some easy things to point at, uh, like a robot that could help an elderly or disabled person in and out of bed. I had an aunt who lived with me her last months after a couple of strokes. And you know, you needed two full-time people in order to uh, make her independent. And she didn't want me to to be taking care of her, to, to help her. She wanted to be independent, and I think we can certainly do things like that. Finding, uh, you know, more IoT commercial things is probably more of a challenge at the moment, but uh, I, I think it'll come. Are there things we shouldn't think about uh, offloading to robots? Are there things you would not want robots to do? Well, let's see, let me go into the, you know, one, one of the contentious places is human labor. Um, you know, robots are going to do more and more jobs that people do now. Now, I, as a robot builder, can argue that those jobs are unpleasant jobs or dangerous jobs, but probably the people who are doing them still want to be doing them because they, maybe they don't have the, the skills to do other things. Uh, the World um, Economic Forum predicts that the net number of jobs will increase as a result of robotics and automation because there'll be all the ancillary things repairing robots, building them, programming them, uh, and, and the like, and that that will outnumber the number of labor jobs that are taken away. The other argument is, even if we don't, right here in Boston, uh, take away a labor job, it'll, there'll be competition from somewhere else that I'm sure will take it away. And then you're faced with the question, uh, you know, where do you want to have the most productivity? Uh, you know, where you're working and, and cultivating or, or somewhere else in the world. So I think there's lots of uh, variables in the equation. Um, I think if we all can remain, have a positive spirit and try and, you know, do a good job, uh, we can end up in a good place. I agree, Mark. The future is bright. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Raybert. Thank you. Thank you.